so let's bring in our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Emma Reed. And Emma is at the University of California, Irvine, and uh, recent PhD graduate. Congratulations, Emma. And um, her work focuses on uh, nearshore or oceanography and both physical and chemical oceanography. And so Emma's going to tell us about, I think, about work in the South China Sea. I'm not sure or off the coast of California. So Emma, it's all yours. We can see your screen. <laughs> okay, perfect. So um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple different deployments that we've done um, using DTS, DTS in ocean settings, um, as well as some lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, so I've included my email here as well as Kristen Davis, my advisor. Um, so you can contact us if you have any um, DTS for ocean application questions. Um, okay, so um, I've been involved in five deployments of DTS, um, and I think each one has um, provided their own challenges. Um, for example, deploying and recovering the cable on a boat. Um, so this is an example um, from San Diego, where we deployed the cable in a lagoon in Los Penasquitos Lagoon. Um, and we had the cable on this inflatable um, raft. Um, this is from Dongsha Atoll, um, where another challenge is when we don't have any land to um, put the instrument on. So this is an example where we built a scaffolding um, in the ocean and then had the instrument as well as the um, solar panels and other equipment on the scaffolding and then deployed the cable from there. Um, more challenges include powering the instrument in a remote location, um, lots of different challenges for ocean settings. Um, but here's an example of some of the data that we've gathered um, from these deployments. Um, these first two figures are showing um, the deployment in Dongsha from 2014, we have just basic mean temperature and then daily temperature range, which um, is something that's significant for coral reefs, which we're studying. Um, and then this is from Ofu in American Samoa, where we deployed the cables in the back reef lagoons. Um, and again, mean and daily temperature range. Um, this is another figure showing just a snapshot in time of the DTS data. So this is the East Reef Flat at Dongsha um, with bathymetry and then um, temperature in time. So you can see how the temperature evolves over um, a day on the reef flat there, which is pretty cool and something that we weren't able to do using the current um, oceanographic instruments available. Um, so the instruments that we've used, um, we use the Sentinel Oryx um, in Dongsha the first time we went. Um, and then for most of the other experiments, we've used the Silixa XT um, just because it's, um, it's the rugged um, instrument, I guess. Um, we've also used the Ultima in one deployment of DTS. Um, and funding, um, we've been really lucky, obviously, to partner with CTEMPS, um, and they've given us a lot of um, great guidance in our different deployments. Um, so we're appreciative of that. And then um, also our funding has come from um, Professor Davis's Coastal Dynamics Lab, as well as an NSF career grant. Um, so the first deployment I'm going to talk about is from Dongsha Atoll, which is an atoll in the South China Sea um, here. Um, the project was designed to study the impact of internal waves on the fore reef and reef flat at Dongsha Atoll. Um, so we used the DTS, um, laid it out on the east reef flat here where the internal waves arrive on the atoll and shoal. Um, and we had a four kilometer cable laid out on the reef flat and then down the reef slope here. Um, so for the first experiment in 2014, um, we used the Oryx. And then in the second experiment in 2019, we used the Slix XT. Um, I'm gonna talk mostly about the 2014 experiment. Um, so that was a 10 day deployment. Um, we took measurements every one minute, every meter along the cable. Um, and the deployment was actually 
interrupted by a tropical storm. Um, we had solar panels during that deployment. Um, and when the tropical storm came through, um, they weren't charging anymore. So the, we lost the instrument power. Um, so the, again, it was a four kilometer cable. Um, we actually, uh, my mouse, we had um, the DTS instrument was set up here on the scaffolding. Um, and then we had a one kilometer cable going in this direction towards the lagoon. And then we had a one kilometer cable, which was spliced in the lab prior to deploying it. Um, and then another two kilometer cable, which went offshore. Um, and the depth was from about half a meter to um, at the terminal end offshore was about 50 meters depth. Um, and then these are just some rough um, estimates of how many people and days it took. Um, I'd say like two days set up in the lab for about two people. And then um, the deployment takes um, a fair number of people out on the boat um, and also like setting up the scaffolding and everything. So um, about two days deployment, two days recovery, um, and then one day tear down in the lab, just, um, you know, packing everything up and um, making sure all the data is um, downloaded and everything. Um, and I'm not including here at any time in the lab, like before the trip, packing, organizing gear, et cetera. Um, so here's some pictures from the deployments. Um, here up in the top, we have, this was the scaffolding, which was built in about, in a couple meters of water, maybe um, a meter and a half of water. So we had the DTS instrument on the lower level. Um, and then we had the solar panels up here on the top of the scaffolding, which were charging the instrument. Um, and then obviously we use this boat to deploy the DTS. Um, in 2014, we had this, um, the DTS set up kind of um, sideways, or sorry, the cable, the fiber optic cable set up kind of sideways and it was on this like lazy Susan kind of contraption. Um, and that's how we spooled out the cable. Um, in other deployments, we've used um, an upright kind of stand, which is, I think better in these um, to better for deploying because the cable doesn't really um, on this sideways lazy Susan contraption, the cable slips and it gets tangled a little bit. So, um, but these are just some pictures of deploying. Um, this is a photo of Kristen um, surveying the cable and attaching some validation sensors to the cable. And then this is just a photo of um, the cable on the four reef slope. Um, the other deployment I'm gonna show you guys is from OFU, American Samoa. Um, here we were looking at temperature variability in the back reef pools. Um, so we had, this was in March, 2017. Um, we had a Celixa XT for this experiment and um, it was a 10 day deployment. Um, we were taking measurements every two minutes um, and every quarter meter along the cable. Um, we had two fiber optic cables in the lagoons, um, both starting about here. And then they kind of were going out and zigzagging. We were just trying to cover as much area as possible within the lagoons. Um, and they were in about zero to two meters depth. Um, this deployment um, didn't take as many people um, just because we weren't using like a, you know, a motor boat. We used a raft kind of, and um, it wasn't, it wasn't as complicated because we had the DTS on land here. Um, we didn't have the whole scaffolding set up. Um, here's some photos from it. Um, so this is how we had the DTS on the raft um, here in an upright position, which is um, easier for deploying. Um, so basically we had the DTS here and then we had a whole bunch of people kind of following along and laying the D, uh, the cable, sorry, not the DTS, we had the cable here and then we were following along and laying the cable where we wanted it, we were walking or swimming. Um, here's a calibration coil with a um, temperature sensor. Um, this was our setup on the beach here. We had the um, instrument on this stand provided to us by C-Temps. 
um, and as, as well as this um, case that the DTS was in. Um, and then this is just a photo of the DTS and the coral. Um, here's a video we have. Um, basically, when we put the cable in the water, we after that, we have to go through or follow along the whole cable and survey it to figure out where exactly it is. So for this, we used um, just a handheld GPS and we'd swim along the cable, taking waypoints along the way, as well as using the track from the GPS. And then um, we'd also take depth measurements along the way. So we have some bathymetry data. Um, okay, so this is a paper um, by Greg Sinnott. Um, it was, can you guys hear me? There's like a echoing. We can hear you, sorry about the echo. No, it's okay. Um, so this paper <clears throat> was a result of a deployment done off Scripps Pier. Um, basically for this deployment, we wanted to test some different fiber optic cable types as well as different instruments um, and also some deployment techniques and different calibration methods. Um, so we did some ambient baths as well as ice baths um, for calibrating in an ocean environment. Obviously, um, if you can't get up to the site every day, an ice bath is difficult to maintain. Um, as well as we tested some different um, buffering methods for the calibration coils using um, some soft coolers on the bottom of the ocean. Um, and the paper also discusses some data analysis of the DTS data and including how to um, reduce RMSE while retaining the highest um, spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, okay, so here's some lessons learned um, from our ocean deployments. Um, so for calibration lessons learned, um, plan for contingencies. Um, at Dongsha in 2019, um, when we were recovering the cable, um, the cable broke and we weren't able to recover um, the terminal coil and sensor for the terminal calibration um, coil. So we ended up using a validation sensor that was closest to the terminal coil for calibration purposes. But um, one of the, just the lesson learned from that is to have, you know, evenly spaced validation um, sensors just in case in you have to use um, them for calibration. Um, another lesson, um, single versus double-ended um, cables. So in OFU, um, we had the cables deployed and then at the ends of the cables, we brought them up on the beach and then we um, spliced the two ends of the cables together so we could have a double-ended um, calibration. Um, splicing on the beach um, in the sand kind of is, it's time consuming, it's complicated, it's difficult, it's, it's dirty. Um, so I don't know. Um, how well we splice the cables. So definitely considering whether um, you're splicing in the field versus in the lab, it's, it's a really different situation. Um, when we actually calibrated the data from the OFU experiment, um, the RMSE wasn't significantly improved with the double-ended calibration. So um, just something to consider before you're deploying. It's probably easier to do your splicing before in the lab. Um, Another um, thing that we've learned is um, just maintaining calibration baths in remote locations. Like I said, um, replacing ice in an ice bath cooler is difficult when you can't get out to your um, site every day. Um, and another thing is um, in ocean environments, the cable can bury itself um, in sand or mud or whatever sort of bottom you have. Um, and this is something that actually um, Maddie Harvey from Scripps was working on writing up, but she um, saw some, you can see in the signal of the data um, where the cable is buried and where it's not buried. So um, definitely something to consider. 
Um, so another other lessons learned um, for de remote deployments, um, obviously where you're setting up the instrument, um, whether you have land or beach or pier, or if you have to set up a scaffolding, um, that's a consideration before you go out to your site. Um, power requirements in remote, remote deployments. Um, so in 2014, like I said, um, we lost the power during a tropical storm because the solar panels weren't charging. Um, but in 2019, when we went back to Dongsha, we used some solar panels and a wind turbine. So we were able um, to maintain the power to the instrument throughout the whole deployment. Um, in Ofu in 2017, um, I blew some fuses. Um, so we couldn't use the solar panels um, and we had to basically charge the batteries and switch them out um, twice a day. So that leads me to my next point of if you're in a remote location, um, bring spare parts, um, extra cables, extra fuses, battery chargers, batteries, um, anything you can think of. Um, if there's no hardware store nearby, just bring extras of everything. Um, and then the last lesson to learn, um, I wanna talk about the equipment. Um, I think, um, we've used a couple different cable types for our deployments um, and learned some different lessons on those. So um, in Dongsha, the first time we went, we used this uh, Kaifone armored cable, which um, you guys have probably talked about. But um, the second time we went, we used this flat black cable, and that was the one that uh, it like snagged on the bottom or some rock something um, and broke when we were trying to recover the cable. So that's definitely a consideration. Um, another thing is um, when we were deploying this flat black cable in Dongsha, um, the, the currents kind of like picked up the cable and it kind of flew around in the currents. So um, just having um, a negatively buoyant as well as um, like the round cable didn't um, have that drag component. Um, as obviously the price is a big consideration, the flat black cable is a lot cheaper than the um, Kaifone armored cable. Um, and then <laughs> in an ocean environment, um, we found that salt water kind of, um, it, it kind of degrades the cable sleeves, um, like the even the um, Kaifone armored cable we found when we recovered it after like, you know, two or three weeks, um, it's, it's a little bit cracked. Um, and so it's a consideration. You probably, you might not be able to like reuse it in a different deployment. Um, the color of the cable um, in shallow water, um, there's the black body heating component. Um, and then we've also found that um, the cables grow algae on it. So that's gonna um, affect your um, results as well. Um, some stress and strain relief um, that we've used in the past, we've used these Yale grips, which are really useful. Um, you can put them on the cable wherever you need them um, and then just kind of tie them up. And um, we've also used these wire cable grips, which are super useful, but you do have to put them on at the very start of the cable. So that's something to consider before you start deploying. Um, and then also chafe protection um, for, um, we've used this like from the instrument into the water from the pier or the scaffolding. Um, we've used this like kind of corrugated um, split pipe um, just to protect the cable when we're um, deploying it or lashing it onto a pier or scaffolding. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer them now or you can um, feel free to email either Kristen or I. Thank you. Well, wow, Emma, very, very uh, informative talk. Thanks so much. Um, any questions for Emma? Did you see any sharks out there? We had polar bears first. Now about sharks? Um, no, no sharks. Not on the DTS deployments. <laughs> on some other ones, though. 
One of the things that, that I thought about looking at your deployment was cable markings. Because um, you know, when you talk about um, surveying your cable in, um, that what you guys, what we need to think about is that there has to be some identifier on the outside of the cable that tells us where we are. And, and I wanna hear a little bit, Emma, about your experience with that. And then I'll talk a little about what we call overstuff and how that can create issues. So go ahead, Emma, what did you learn? What did you think about uh, the cable markings and how convenient they were on different cables? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely difficult to survey the cable markings. You have to kind of get really, they're really tiny on the cables. Um, so definitely a lot of note taking um, when you're surveying and making sure you know like where the cable starts at the instrument because it might not be like meter mark zero. Um, and yeah. Yeah. There, and also in an ocean environment, I found they do rub off a little bit. So this is key that um, you think you have a cable that's marked and then some days later or when you're when it's sliding over one of your little protections or whatever it might be, it will rub off the markings and now you have an unmarked cable. But in any case, a key piece is that the fiber length can well be different than the cable length because a fiber does not go in a straight line through the, the cable. There's usually about a 1% difference. So what you need to do is put some sort of indicator on the cable. It could be a cold pack or a hot pack or something to verify real locations along that. So you'll run an experiment where you're turning on your DTS and you're actually you know, coordinating with someone to say, aha, yeah, here I've got my cold pack. It depends on how essential registration is for you. But if you want to associate, for example, in Emma's case, a particular pool with a particular temperature, you need to know where you're at. And so this idea of registration and cable markings is, is pretty complicated. And we've worked a lot with the manufacturers on marking better, but fundamentally it's almost always a challenge. Okay, any other uh, questions? Can I ask yeah. a question, John, for, uh, for Emma? Um, in our application, the optic foxes love the cable and uh, a fox chewed the, uh, the, uh, our dust cable and, uh, and broke it uh, twice. And, uh, but the, uh, the DTS cable was more rigid and uh, it couldn't be uh, chewed. In your marine application, did you find any sea creature who'd love to chew the cable? Um, I didn't know. Um, we've had other instruments that have gone missing mysteriously, and we think those were possibly chewed off, but we had, we didn't have any um, problems with the cables, no, with the fiber optic cables. And this is a very interesting point, and, and it, it, for example, deer, um, deer, when they see a, a bending, a curvy linear object, they will jump on it. They think it's a snake. And so deer will jump up and down on your cables and, and break your cables. So if you have deer, um, also what we call um, uh, martens in, in Luxembourg, martens would eat our cables. Um, and beaver in Oregon, the beaver state, and we have beaver chewing cables. So that armoring and exactly what sort of armoring you use is really important. Emma mentioned a kyphone cable. And one of the things about that cable is that it's somewhat armored but it's somewhat not armored because the armoring does not give good tensile uh, um, protection. And so sometimes if you, you saw Emma's cable was nice and loosely laid on the ground of the, of the ocean, that's fine. But if the cable ever should get taut, the Kyphone cable we found has some problems. It'll change its attenuation. The other thing is Emma brought up a really cool point about these Yale cable grips, which are great. But whenever you grip a cable at one point, you're creating a potential stress point. So if anything happens to the cable, if there's like a, 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 you know, a drag force because of water movement on the cable that kind of tends to pull it, then all that stress will be concentrated at the grip. So what we often do is use rocks. We'll just put rocks on the cable, very, very, um, that they, they give a little bit of ability to move, but also give it, are securing it in many, many locations. And that way we can avoid stress concentration because when you concentrate stress, you can break the fiber, you can create all sorts of problems. It's a really tricky thing, how to hold onto a cable, because if you hold on to too tightly, you can break it. So anyway, I really appreciate Emma bringing that up. Now, I'll just make one final comment too. If you are in an environment where you think the cable is gonna get eaten by something, and Ming is exactly right, a lot of animals 
will try to go for the plastic. They seem to like the saltiness of the taste, I guess. We do have some cable that has actually stainless steel braid on the outside of the cable. So it actually looks like a braided <clears throat> steel um, hose that you might see for high pressure. And that's pretty resistant to any animal once they start to chew into the braided steel. So Ming, talk to us next time. We can probably line you up with some of that for DAS, for the DAS cable. The fiber, the cable you used has some fiberglass in it for DTS. And I think animals tend not to like the fiberglass. Yeah, exactly. So they bite in a little ways and stop. But again, animals are tricky. They'll eat anything. And the density point that Emma made was really good. If you're putting something on the bottom of a, of a, of a marine system, uh, if the cable is denser than the mud, then it's gonna work into the mud. And so we actually will sometimes use cables that are not quite so dense, so they won't sink in. Or we want a cable that's really dense because we wanna penetrate the mud. And so this issue of density of cables, the all plastic cable, the mini flat drop, has a very, the density is essentially that of water. It really barely sinks. And so each of these cables has a different density. It's really worth noting that if you're putting it into the environment and density is gonna matter, you can get them all the way from being densities of like four times that of water to 1.5 times that of water to equal to, or floating. And we've floated cables off the back of boats. We floated multi-kilometer cables off the back of a boat and we're able to look at, at surface ocean temperatures. So we, again, using lower density cables can sometimes be useful.